Okay. So, figure I'd go over this circuit again. On the left side here, you have this is based off the Bedini SG pulse motor system and um, how he captures the flyback with his circuit. There's, there's two batteries in his system and there's one bifiler. One of the windings is the trigger winding, that would be the thinner gauge, and the thicker gauge is the, the drive coil. Give me a second. So, and in the Bedini system, the thicker winding is the one that receives power from the battery. In this setup, we are not using a bifiler to trigger, although you can. But let's forget about that for right now because it's not important how you trigger this. What's important is that you guys understand the switching method. And I'm going to go over some things that you know you guys might ask in the future, such as well, if you're you know, let me just say this this circuit requires four transistors. And people are going to say, well, do these transistors need to be matched? And the answer to that is no. I'll go over that later. But in the Bedini system, you have two batteries. You have the run battery and the charge battery. In this system, okay, and in the Bedini system, you know, when the, when the, Run battery is fully empty. Charging then your wheel is going to stop, or the, the oscillation stops. There's no more power in the run, in the running battery, and until you switch the positions of the two batteries, and then you can turn it back on. So, and I've done this and seen it firsthand. You know, one battery dumped into the other, and so on, and it works. This circuit is designed to make it so you don't have to flip the batteries once the run battery is fully drained. And so what happens here is, let's say you look at the battery on the left, okay? Got a 12 volt battery here. Disregard these caps, they're just there for another reason than these diodes. <clears throat> but you got the battery here running the system and it, and it dumps into the other battery over on the other side, right? Over to here. Just like your typical Bedini circuit. Only the thing is, this is a modification of the Bedini system where instead of the batteries flipping once one is drained and the other is charged, which takes hours, if not a day or more. These batteries here are being flipped every half cycle, or once, uh, once every cycle. So a battery on the left will charge up the bottom coil right here when these two switches are closed, you see, charge it up, at which point, keep in mind the other coil that charges up from the other battery, over here on the right side, is not getting charged because the negative side and the positive side are open. See, 
bus in the 1205 hour here. Okay, goes out to this uh, Zener diode here, for the 12 volt Zener plus, plus, and then it feeds right here, top coil. Okay, plus of uh, this battery on the other side feeds the other coil, the bottom coil, right here. Okay, and uh, so that's that. Well, let's start out on the left side here. The, this battery on the left charges up the bottom coil because the switches are closed now. Hey, Mike, how's it going? And the switch is open. The flyback, okay, let me just say this. Here's the positive on the left side here. Okay, it charges this side of the coil, positive. And the negative of the battery is here. See, negative up charges this side of the coil. Okay, because of these diodes, negative don't go that way. It goes right here. Ne negative does not go this way. It goes right there. Negative and positive right there. Charges up. These two switches are closed. It charges. These two switches will now open and will dump out this way. Okay, this, this negative is right here will become a positive when the flyback occurs, and the positive flyback will go out this diode, the high voltage 4007, and you all know this from the basic. What's up, guys? Hey, how's Jim? What's up? So I'm just uh, going over the uh, Bedini circuit in this video. And it's, it's basically uh, the Bedini circuit times two, what you see here in the, in the diagram. So, yeah, I tested it out. I was quite surprised uh, that having just two switches, I was, uh, I was not dumping the flyback into the battery. And I had to add two more switches to make it instead of dump into the other coil, which is what was happening with just two switches, it was dumping into the other coil. So I added two more switches and now it, it dumps, and it, it's gonna have to go into the battery. So I, I'm just pretty much going over that in this video here. I just made this video like an hour ago. And it goes into the positive rail of this battery. But uh, I don't know, have you, Mike. Have you ever done the Bedini circuit? Yeah, I've done it uh, basically when I first started in this about twenty years ago. <laughs> so and, uh, how'd that go? It went all right, but I, I figured there was something missing. It wasn't getting the reactive power being generated in the coil like it, I thought it. Then I switched over to the automotive relay switch and I started noticing a huge difference in potential in the flyback. Now, it kind of makes sense because if you look at, you know, what Tesla had to work with back in his time, he didn't have, you know, MOSFETs and um, switches like what we have today, transistors. And he was always working with disruptive discharge. So I, I started using the automotive relay switch and I started noticing my flyback was that much more effective and it was charging the batteries that much better. As long as you had. Yeah, I noticed the same thing. Yeah. So I kind of stuck with it. I tested both systems like immensely. Just constantly testing. When you say both and, systems, which other one are you referring to? Well, using uh, a MOSFET versus using a disruptive switch, uh, oh. relay switch. So what I noticed with the automotive relay switch when I first started using it was too slow. So I did a little modification right. to the armature and advanced the armature so the gap was smaller. The second I did that, I got double the speed out of it. 
and also the flyback, the high voltage spikes also increased. When I You're talking about the spark gap right now. Right, right. So I was getting just as good performance with the, uh, you know, with the spark gap, but it, it has to do with the disruptive discharge, the actual disconnect. That disconnect creates a shock wave. I guess that's the best way to describe it. And that shock wave, at that time, I figure was creating, I guess you could say like a, a reactive power scenario in the coil. And my gains started increasing as I did this. So, sorry, oh, one sec, I just got to put the phone down. <laughs> um, so you know that I saying kinda... they say with every action there's an equal and opposite reaction well when it comes to the reverse flyback there is undoubtedly an opposite reaction because yeah. it's a reverse polarity it's completely right. an opposite it's reaction. left in the pole yeah incredible and you know i i i got a, a you know a degree in uh, itt and uh, electronics and didn't know this stuff, you know, until recently. And and I've replicated the Bedini thing like a long time ago, and I still didn't yeah. understand it. Right. See, and, the, uh, the flyback is uh, like crazy. In, yeah, like in most motors, that flyback is basically they look at it as parasitic. So they do whatever they can to short itself out. Okay, so they'll uh, usually hook up a capacitor. Uh, from positive to negative, and that flyback is now gone. Well, why would you get rid of a flyback if it's giving you power back? Like if you're putting, you know, they get rid of it because it destroys their relays, and they use the capacitors to absorb the exactly, you know. exactly. So, they, the way of thinking and the way I think is always outside the box. You know, I, I've always gone against the grain, so to speak, in every way. Um, but yeah, I, I was seeing these gains. And as I progressed, uh, one day, one fateful day, that was kind of a game changer in my circuit, was adding the barium titanate transducer to the negative in my coil. And man, did it come alive. It Say that again. You were using your uh, barium titanate as your core. Trans yeah. Uh, well, what I was doing is attaching the barium titanate transducer from positive to negative, in you know, in parallel with the coil. And when I did that, the flyback went through the roof. Like it just took off. Like it was like not just a, a little gain. It was a really, really, really large gain. So, a um, barium tightening was your core material. Yeah, yeah, that's what the transducer is made of. Yeah. yeah, and so far that one's the best one. When you I say transducer, have. transducer, you're referring to like a, a, a electromagnet? Uh, no, it's an ultrasonic transducer. Here, I'll show you what it is. It's actually I got one here. Yeah. This is a this is oh. a wafer. Okay, so you got the positive, negative, and that's barium titanate in there. Yeah, that's barium titanate. It's like a almost like a ceramic type material. And is that is that was in series with the uh, circuit? No, it's in, in parallel. In parallel. Which part of the circuit you have it parallel? Okay, so so the positive would go to the positive side of the coil, and the negative the the transducer oh, okay. would go to the negative side of the coil, so it's in parallel with it. And you're just so, taking the flyback from the coil into the transducer. Right, exactly. And it ricochets back in a shock wave and creates a massive huh. reactant power scenario in the coil. Now, yeah, I heard I you mention that a few times. I wasn't quite understanding what you were talking about, though. Yeah. With the piezoelectric so, thing, right? Right. So it's a combination of reactance power gain in the coil as well as putting that coil into, I would say, into a hyper state of resonance. It, it's increasing, like this uh, This one here will resonate at 41 kilocycles, okay, at uh, 40 watts. 
So I can pump a crap load of power into this little transducer. Now, if you got a coil, that's, well, the one I have in my Renegade right now is 2.2 pounds of a 24 gauge wire with an iron core, which is laminated core. The, the, the turn on and the collapse of the field is lightning fast. So by the time the next cycle comes up, before that field has a chance to completely collapse, it's already rebounding back. And because of this, I'm getting, well, not only a huge amount of gains, my efficiency also is increased by tenfold. Like my Renegade right now, I've got as low as, uh, well, I'm heading into microwatts of input. And uh, I put it up to the scope and I'm getting 0.764 kilowatts of vacuum of spike. So I'm putting less than less than two, two watts total input into the system, and then I'm getting basically about 22 watts out. So, yeah. Okay, so the piezoelectric thing is creating the shock wave. Yeah, and it resonates. It's like ringing a bell. When you ring a bell, it's gonna create a harmonic. And I think the harmonic with the voltage and the flyback, they hit each other and creates this vibration because Tesla talks about the vibration extensively in some of his writings. It's energy, frequency, vibration. While this thing is making it vibrate, this is where your vibration is coming from. Now, if you look at what Newman was doing, he was putting high voltage into a very large inductor and getting huge amount of power. He was running, his, his motor was 7,000 pounds. Yeah, he was and a, he was, his motor was a pure uh, volt energy motor. Energy demand. No. Yeah, that's right. No current. A lot of yeah, people think uh, it's, there's current here, but that's no. the point of the dead nine volt batteries, you know? Right, exactly. See, the, where the current is being created in the coil itself, all you have to do through the Provide potential that. of the high voltage, of, even though there's no current in those batteries, they're still producing a potential. Right, exactly. You don't need current. Right, so, you just so, need enough force to get through your coil. Yeah, exactly. And 50 milliamps into a 7,000. Force is not force. is not flow. It's right. force. They're two different things, right? Exactly. It's energy. You got flow and you got force. Right, exactly. So when you got a high potential or AKA voltage and you pump that into a very large inductor and you have a very fast, rapid- and You can convert, uh, you can convert flow to force and force to flow. You can convert them. Flow right. is your current and force is your volts. Right. You sacrifice so, one for the other. You know? Right. But everything merges within the coil and that's where you create the current. Because if he wasn't generating any current, there's no way that motor would move. So that means that the current is created within the coil, not from the battery input. That's what he was trying to get, you know, through into everybody's minds. That you don't need current to run a motor. You have big enough inductor and you put a high voltage. Uh, yeah, people can't it. grasp that though. They can't yeah, grasp it. It goes. It goes totally against <laughs> electrical. You, you do need. You do way. need a micro. You do need a micro milli watt. Yeah, or something. That's right. To, you, you need a bit of a flow. Yeah, exactly. Tiny, tiny amount. Nothing. What people are dreaming of all this. Right. Everybody like wants to build these, you know, high current free energy things, and it's really not a high current free energy. It's a high force. Free right. energy. Right. I it's suggest you get, everybody get away from the current and you can still utilize the, the volts all day long. Yeah. Like uh, the first thing I would say to anybody who's getting into this stuff, I would watch every single video that Eric Dollar has put out. Yeah, I've been and watching him for watch, years, man. Right. And I watch his videos. Sometimes I'll watch a certain video, you know, all day. 
I'll just Do you know what they're really working on? Mobile. They're working on like a uh, seismic device right now. Yeah, the seismic device. He needs a giant antenna for that. That's the problem. And much of that infrastructure has been removed now. It's、uh, in the U.S. It's that's it's what I heard. That that's why he moved out to that Indian reservation and took over those、yeah. uh, ab- abandoned、uh, phone system. Right. So he, he was going to wire it up into a huge array of a of a of, a, of an antenna array. Now the other、uh, question would be: Is is that area、uh, interest?、Uh, I don't know if they're still doing that, but they're onto a new project that's also a seismic device, but it's smaller,、mm-hmm. and it's using big ring coils or something like that. Yeah, but you know, anybody who gets into this stuff, I think to get yourself deprogrammed from the regular academia, Eric Dollard is a good start because he is a real old school RCA engineer. Okay,、yeah. and if you want to learn the fundamentals of electricity and how electricity is derived. From counter space, if you don't understand what counter space is, you'll never understand electricity. Okay, a lot of people think like, well, if you go to most engineers now that graduate from you know, your local university, and you ask them how、uh, what is electricity, they wouldn't be able to give you a, de- a definitive answer.、And、the answer to the question is, what is electricity? What do I need to make electricity? You need two things: dielectric and magnetism. Without the one or the other, you do not get electricity. And you ask any engineer out there, they probably wouldn't be able to give you that answer. All right, so you need those two components: dielectricity and magnetism. When those two form together, that's when you get electrical power. So a lot of people just don't understand that. Right, because your、uh, your house lines. I'm an electrician too by trade. Thirty years doing high voltage work. Your house wires are full、mm-hmm. of EMF only when you're, you know, loading the line. Right. When you're when you're not loading the line, there's there's very little of the of that. There's still EMF there, but it's very little. And yeah, that means well, that means electromagnetic field. Right.、Like、you said second, you need a magnetic、yeah. field. That's right. You don't have no flow without that. Mag- There's still a small amount of magnetic field in an unloaded wall socket. It's、mm-hmm. just not nothing to worry about. It's it's like micro nano watts. But、yeah. once you plug something into it, whatever amps you're loading, now、That's、you're、right. creating an EMF EMF field on that line in your wall. That's and right. And it's spread throughout the line. You know, it's so. That's right. So, It becomes very parasitic, and what Daryl. If you cross a low, if you cross a network cable over it, or、uh, it's fine. But if you run a network cable parallel to it,、That's、you're getting、right. too much of that field, and now all of a sudden your your digital、yeah. packets aren't moving. Yeah, that's right. And he said, you know,、um, the way the power grid is implemented in the modern day today, there's too much parasitic、uh, energy going through those. The harmonics that are going through those wires are very detrimental to the human body. You know, sixty hertz, sixty hertz, fifty hertz is actually better than sixty hertz. But sixty hertz with the human body, it's not good for us at all. So day in and day out, we're surrounded by all this parasitic. Uh, electromagnetic frequencies from power.、Uh, from their well,、phone. I don't know, man. You know, I I spent some、you、time、know. in Europe under under 50 hertz.、Uh, my family's from Bulgaria. Oh,、I'll、spend many many months over there, and they're still buzzing in the lines. It's nothing. They're still the buzzing. Yeah, and it, it like, probably it's, it's, not, it's probably not good for us in any way, shape, or form.、Um, some people are a lot more sensitive to this radiation than others, right? What's、uh, cool about the radiant energy is that it it lights up lights without any need for a current, you know. Yeah, well, I've worked with some experiments where、uh, Tesla was doing the experiments, and he only needs one wire. Well, I've I've actually recreated that actual experiment. And you don't need a ground wire when you work with a Tesla、um, a Tesla power system. It's a one wire system. Your what your ground can be the air. It could be an aerial. It could be your hand. It could be anything. But in actual fact, you, you know, lighting up a light bulb with one wire, everybody will look at you like you've got three heads. <laughs> They go, how, how would that actually be possible? 
but it is. I've, uh, re I've recreated that experiment does more. It's not that hard to do. You could actually you just you, yeah the inside the uh, the neons. It's gas. You know, once you excite the the gas, it it it, it radiates its own light. Yeah. Well, even like I did uh, the experiment actually with uh, Tesla plasma. Even plasma. even an even a conductor, you excite the conductor. You know, if it's thin enough and it can handle the uh, the uh, the excitement or the yeah. vibration without burning up, yeah. it will shine. You know, emit yeah. light. Yeah, like we can make the power grid today a lot more efficient. All you have to do is change the frequency. That's it. You know how bright Maybe. magnesium is. Oh, if you could take. I, I, yeah. If you could take a, a, a magnesium material to create an LED, oh, you're kidding me. Yeah, it would yeah. be so bright you couldn't even look at it without fire. without igniting the magnesium though, without actually setting it on fire, but but yeah. getting it to emit the light. Well, if you hit it with a high frequency, it won't catch on fire. Yeah, you know, right. hit it with a lower frequency with more current. Yeah, it's going to go up like a Roman candle. But what I was saying earlier, what magnesium? Uh, yeah. Yeah, mm. as soon as you put amps into magnesium, oh yeah, she'll blow. Yeah. Uh, what I was saying is, with our power grid system today, we could actually make it way more efficient than what it is. All you have to do is change that 60 hertz to say 240 hertz. And guess what? The power consumption goes down by more than half. So. And would you mind and, explaining why? Is it well? It's why the, the higher frequency? Power. So when you're when you're running at a higher frequency, it, you're the potential needed to do the same job decreases because you're and the you're, loss you're, goes down as well because the transmission right. is more secure. That's right. That's right. That's why you know these super high frequencies can go super long distances and not lose that much power. And that's that's the key to our power grid system. If you want to fix it and make it way more efficient. This go from 60 hertz even to 120 hertz would make a huge difference. Right. You know, double double the frequency. What is it I would with hit. the uh, the grid so afraid to change frequencies? Like your devices are going to have a problem or something? That's not it, true. It, no, it's not true at all. It, it's just everything that we've built AC wise is based on 120 volts. In Europe, it's 240. Right, it would actually be easier to switch over in Europe because they use 240. So you just have to re-rig the input of all your AC devices with a higher voltage transfer. Well, no, in Europe they, they use a 240 on a single way. Here we right. we, we also have that on a three-phase yeah. panel. Right, but, right, right. But uh, you know they don't in in the in the in the in the east they don't have. You know, 110 or 120 on a single leg, but that's, no way. That's right. Yeah. So, like my wife's so all your devices are, are have transformers that can handle to that much voltage. It's not the frequency right. that blows them out; it's the high voltage. Yeah. It's the high voltage. So, all you have to do is re-break all all our electronic stuff to handle a higher voltage input. You know, yeah. it's just but the, the frequency is not playing a role here in the in, no. in the trans in the transformer. No. Exactly. I think it boils down to is what's going through the power lines. You know, because... you can always step down the frequency with at the at the at your pole with the capacitor or something. Yeah. So it's a combination of um, you know the combinations between frequency, um, what you're actually doing with that power. So if it's for power transmission, I'd be jacking up the frequency way higher. Yeah, but here here the grid is not using flyback to power anything. Right. Yeah. The flyback, which is, which, is, which is an oxymoron, if you ask me. Like even Dollard said too, like there is so much energy potential in a power grid system that it's almost self-sustaining. You don't actually have to add it to it. There's, there's so a there's a guy on the YouTube. Capacity. There's yeah. another guy on YouTube who did a coil out of gold. M one M one Tech Industries. I'll get you his link, but. He, uh, you know, built Tesla coil and, you know, it's just flying back, you know, uh, primaries flying back into the secondary with the flyback 
in, in flying into the secondary and and stimulating uh you know high frequency 2.52 megahertz you know and two plus five plus two is nine you know yeah. it, it's a higher frequency and he's getting great results my thing is stay in the kilohertz range because right. once you get into the megahertz range it's not so good for you know cells and biology right. yeah there's frequencies out there that you gotta watch out for yeah the super high frequencies are not good for your cells so yeah kilohertz and then and below the megahertz is fine long term you know if you're in the kilohertz you can do that indefinitely and there's uh there's lists out there uh uh earl james rife he uh, basically studied all these frequencies which ones are good for your body which ones heal certain parts of your body and that list is out there there's a company called spooky too they make frequency generators mic generators and they got a free pdf you can actually download and it has a list of all the frequencies and all the different health ailments and studies that were done according to the certain frequency for the health ailment that could actually help you out so and they're all in the kilohertz too the yeah, right a lot of them are a lot of them are yeah there are some uh, but, in the lower like, you know you could take the 2.52 megahertz drop it down to like a, a multiple in kilohertz that is also resonant and let's say we take a let's say we take kilohertz and i just guess a number here from one kilohertz to uh, uh 999 kilohertz let's go to mm -hmm. 500 kilohertz let's make it a resonant frequency let's add five plus four plus zero let's do 540 kilohertz and we have a resonant frequency here you know any one of these ranges five plus four and zero is nine you can do uh, 552 520 kilohertz five plus yeah. uh, five 510 kilohertz sorry yeah. five plus one plus zero is six so tesla with the 369 thing is very accurate in stating yeah you know and that's what those I numbers. found. With, uh, yeah, that's what I found that really helped me out getting. It's so easy with those numbers to to determine if yeah. you, if your frequency is within a range of resonant uh, 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 positions in the bandwidth. You know, not all frequencies are resonant frequencies. No, no, it, it all depends on the uh, capacitance and inductance of the coil that you're using. Right, all your components will change your will change the outcoming frequency, the ultimate out, output frequency. Right, it's like ringing the bell. If you if you hit the bell too hard, it's going to be all distorted. It's not going to be in resonance. If you hit it just right, with the right potential, the right uh, amplitude of the power hitting it, then you're going to get the ring. And you'll see it. It, it is night and day when you see the difference in the power output. And I think that's what you know. My yes, do I, I firsthand had seen that with the Bedini SG circuit trying to restore batteries. Now, I hooked up a, uh, a trigger, a solid state trigger, and, and bypassed the uh, trigger winding and went with a, uh, you know, some Chinese uh, PWM or whatever I can't remember to trigger the transistor on my little Bedini circuit to get it to trigger at 432 hertz is you know or, or two as close to a resonant frequency as i can get it to trigger to yeah. and the same battery was totally sulfated and i was pulsing it with the bedini wheel and uh yeah. at to any any frequency that the battery allowed it to, to pulse at when i and that that frequency was never a, 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 free, a, a, a i'm guessing it was never a resonant one because I wasn't getting any charge results on this sulfated battery for over a year trying to get this thing to react uh, under the pulse. <laughs> All other other sulfated batteries that were less sulfated reacted under the Bedini pulse, but this one particular battery was so damaged. And all of a sudden, as soon as I bypassed the, bi the, the, the trigger winding with a solid state trigger, and I was able to keep it running at a, at a, at a stable, as close to 432 Hertz, as possible frequency, which is the note A, um, all of a sudden I'm getting charge. Like I'm getting uh, uh, results here, you know, yeah. slow rise. Yeah. 
It's so, like, uh, I've always uh, looked at it like tuning an instrument, musical instrument. Without that musical instrument tuned just right, it's going to ring. That that ring is now going to desulfate those plates. It's it's a vibration. It's a frequency. Going back to Tesla again, energy, frequency, vibration. Those uh, plates inside they start vibrating. They now what's going to happen is that they're going to desulfate. As they desulfate, you're regenerating those batteries. Again. So you yeah, they're being uh, they're being vi- they're being uh, vibrated with implosive vibrations. That's right. Yeah. Not a, not a single explosive force yeah. on it. It's all pull 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 pull. Right. You know, it's like right. so. <laughs> the, the sure way that you know if your system is running correctly, the electromagnet <laughs> receives the push, 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 push. Right. Your your battery is receiving the opposite force. The pull, 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 pull. Yeah, pull. it's a bounce. So right. if your system is creating heat, you're not creating the negative energy. You're not getting it. It's when your your uh, energy is there, you're getting the result, but there's no heat whatsoever. Like my inductors, if I get it tuned just right, my inductor can actually start. I've never experienced system. heat on the outs output of the reverse flyback side of the, any circuit. I've you always experienced the heat on the on the on the uh, opposite side of the of the reverse right. flyback of the same circuit, right. which would be the resistor yeah. on the base or whatever. See, like my coils, they tend to cool down as they run. I've actually had one decrease in uh, temperature by yeah the coils will uh if the coil is receiving forward voltage it will heat up if you're yep. feeding a coil with reverse flyback voltage that's right i don't think it's going to heat up no it never will never will you know never destroy or hurt a battery so how would you go about doing that how would you go about uh, you gotta, you gotta ultimately, you gotta feed some coil with positive voltage. You gotta heat up some coil to drive another right. coil cold, right? That's fine, but you can do all this by directing it with diodes. Diodes are a really big key. What do you think of this idea? Listen here, you just, you just gave me an idea. Take a, a thicker winding coil, yeah, so it never heats up. And use that coil only to generate flyback, and keep it yeah. cool, and exactly. only send well, the flyback from that coil drives your other coil. That's right, always. And, and you never and you use that hit. initial coil to drive anything. Yeah, I've, I've you just use it to create habit. a flyback, and that initial yeah. coil is a thick gauge, really thick. Yeah, that'll take so it more. So it has no resistance to your low voltage at all. You know. Yes. You have but, zero yeah. loss. I like I like using diodes because I can direct the voltage in the direction I want it to go into, not where it wants to go. I can redirect it in the direction I actually want it to go in. The four zero zero seven. Yeah, four zero zero seven, and or there's a bunch four, of them. four zero zero nine. Five. Yeah, nine through five. You have to play with them. Yeah, it's it's a balancing act. So. And also an internal capacitance of the system. Like Jeremiah, he says, you know, like my system is doing some great stuff, but he calls it parasitic. I don't think it's parasitic at all because it's reactive power. And because of the transducer, it's uh, keeping it at 41 kilocycles uh, vibration in the coil. I don't think it's parasitic at all. So I kind Which of one are you talking about? The, are you talking about the uh, the, uh, the, 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 the the renegade? My, my renegade that, setup. That's based off the the motor, uh, the Adams motor. Yeah, the Adams motor generator. Yeah. And the Adams motor is where where is where is this parasitic supposed to being? A, well, he, being? he said he's well. He says it's within the coil itself. Which which one? The drive coil of the Adams motor? Yeah, the drive coil. Well, if it's receiving forward positive voltage from your battery, it, it probably is. Uh, only Mark. if the coil is is a thin gauge and it's resisting your forward voltage right. in any way, shape, or form, that's going right. to create a loss. But if you thicken yeah. the, the the winding and re- re- lower the impedance on the yeah. or the resistance. 
and re remove the resistance that it has by thickening out the gauge and keeping the number of turns to, to maintain your uh, desired bolts on the flyback, right. you can re get around that. Yeah. Oh, so if you're if you're using a like a, let's say a thin gauge because uh, you don't want to spend money on a thicker gauge, well that's fine. But that thin gauge is going to have a higher resistance. Now, yeah. if you have a lower resistance, you can increase the volts, lower the amps, and still get the same uh, volts yeah. flybacks that you're looking for without yeah. any I, any heat or any loss mm. in any way. Shape, you know, without I going usually, down to a superconductor like gold yeah. or something, you just yeah. thicken out your gauge. Yeah. Like let's say I, go I, with a gauge twelve or a gauge ten wire with three hundred yeah, turns. Really yeah, like just a regular spool of. I like. Oil. I personally stay with a lot more wines. You know, I go by weight. When Tesla was setting up his coils, he never went by turns; he went by mass. Right. So I like to stay at two pounds uh, or higher for mass, and usually the gauge I stay within twenty-two to twenty-four uh, gauge wire. Which and a lot what, of what what turns are you are you looking to keep? How many hmm. turns? Would it, uh, what in size wise or? But no matter I no go matter by the way, gauge. I you, go by you, a, you don't care how many turns. Nope. Uh, turns is irrelevant. It's mass. Mass determines how, what's going to happen with the coil, not the turns. Well, I mean, if you only have uh, let's say twenty turns on a. On a thick gauge wire and you're only giving it 12 yeah. volts you're not going to get a high 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 voltage spike that's right you, you, yeah uh, it's all based on mass and that's uh, even tesla backs that up he, he never counted the one but you still yeah, need the turns right. to get the higher voltage spike right right so the more the more uh mass you have obviously you can have a lot more turns so it, it's well you could have a lot less turns with a thicker gauge and still have more mass yeah, like this goes back, you know, it's one of these ones uh, where everybody has their way of being. What I'm saying stuff. is if you if you if you have fewer turns and, and a thicker gauge and you still yeah. want to have a higher voltage spike, you raise your input voltage to that fewer turns, thicker gauge winding. And, but you lower well, the the amps at the same time that you raise the volts and do that well, with the current. The one thing I did find out. Like the Actually, Newman, like the Newman system, you know, he used yeah. Litzwire, but you could still raise your bolts higher, yeah. lower the amps, and use a fewer turns winding with more mass. Actually, you know how you get uh, huge flybacks? The diameter of the coil matters. Apparently, the larger the diameter, the more mass. The... No, the diameter. It's the actual size of the diameter of the loop surface area the larger the large yeah exactly the larger that loop is or you know if you take the uh, thing and cut it in half uh say a one inch diameter is going to have less flyback than a two inch diameter coil the larger the diameter of the coil the bigger your flybacks can you could use a you know if you use a, a, a sheet of aluminum foil you would still get the same uh, um, you know, effect, but lower voltage. <clears throat> yeah. Low, low voltage. So, so like, so you Tesla's need the winding coil, to get the high voltage. You know, you need the winding to get the high voltage. Yeah. The collect. Well, you're Chris. When you got a bigger diameter of a coil, <clears throat> the field is larger, right? And that field is larger. Now your collapse is going to be that much bigger of a collapse instead of a smaller diameter. It's a short collapse. But to get a bigger back EMF spike, the bigger the diameter is, the bigger the spike is going to be. So that's why Tesla always made his coils very, very large diameter. You know, and he had, always had them spaced. Like he always worked with uh, no cores. So no cores. Some of the no cores. You know, basically just coils of wire. Each each and every layer, they're all separated. They're not together tightly wound. He had spaces in between. He had insulation in between. And that, that apparently was a very uh, key thing in his uh, coil designs. 
Know yeah, well, uh, you know, you know, in a, in a coil that big, the way Tesla made them, if you put a core in there, you better be make sure that core is not going to fly oh. out. Yeah, um, <laughs> you were to get maybe maybe that's the reason he didn't use cores, you know. Well, yeah, and you know, the blew the roof out one day. <laughs> oh, for sure, it blow up half the block. But you know, the second you introduce a core into a coil setup, you know, you're just creating huge amount of current. Like just his Tesla coil, at say a million volts. He was actually producing with no core, twenty five hundred amps. Okay, at a million volts. How many watts? There's a. There must be a threshold. That, you know, once you get to a certain voltage, doesn't doesn't require core material anymore. You don't need it. You know, it the, the collapsing field. And, the, the, um, the, the, the 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 space, the air, whatever becomes your. Right. Be, becomes right. a sufficient a sufficient core material at a certain high he's, he's drawing in the radiant energy from the atmosphere into that coil but having a core yeah. helps at lower voltages of no no doubt yes no doubt. yeah at a, when you're scaling it down for sure but you know the scale heels he was working with and the voltage input that he was putting into imagine if he had a core in, in that in the, in, the, in in some of his coils what, what kind of a oh, magnetic field would he have generated you know ridiculous ridiculous like if he did that today the FCC would be all over his ass <laughs> you know yeah. like, uh, maybe he maybe he did have a core in one of his earlier experiments of a huge coil that he built and maybe that's very well in, could have in Tinguska well you know when he turned it on or something mm. like you know back in those days the FCC I mean, how big were his coils like 15 feet yeah. tall yeah and then how and the diameter was like what like the two foot diameter oh, yeah it was using uh, anywhere from eight to ten miles of wire and you know I know on the prototypes he showed the public don't have a core who's to say he wasn't working with cores in the beginning of his experiments and before he went public I've, I've actually seen a genuine Tesla coil uh I was in uh California about five years ago in Hollywood uh, up on the mountain, they have an observatory there. If you go up where the Hollywood sign is, uh, we rented a car, my wife and my family, and uh, we drove up that mountain, and there's an observatory up there about halfway up. So we stopped in there, and lo and behold, we walk in, and they're doing an original Tesla coil demonstration of an original made Tesla coil that was made by him. And I was just in bloody awe. You you couldn't lift my jaw off the ground. It was it hit the floor pretty hard. I was just like deer in headlights, like oh my god. You know, I I live not far from the Coral Castle. I've never visited. I gotta go. I, I never oh, been. man, seeing that I mean, Tesla you know, coil. I know you're in Canada. Do you want me to film anything for you or document anything? Sure, I'm gonna sure. go. Yeah, yeah, do it. Man. Like I live like not far from Niagara Falls, and I mean, I'll film Tesla. like you know a little mm -hmm. anything on the writings on the rocks. <clears throat> well, I've been to Pearl Street where Edison put up the first power station in your New York City, so I've been to that site, and I've been to the Tesla Monument in Niagara Falls. I live about an hour's drive from there, so I've been to that. And yeah, there's a lot, quite a bit of Tesla stuff in the Niagara region. If, you know, anybody out there's a, a Tesla buff. And eventually, I honestly think I honestly think that Tesla was just onto that flyback thing. You know? I mean, he knew that stuff. He it was definitely a was. It was definitely he knew a he knew about the implosion, the implosive force of. He knew about the equal opposite reaction. You know, they, they say that was Einstein. Einstein's yeah. kept pointing the finger at Tesla. Einstein's a think, total think about that phrase. Think about that phrase that Einstein says: "For every action, there is equal reaction." But, but uh, what word did I leave out? What word I left out? Opposite, and that's the yeah, word opposite, Tesla. Yeah. That's Tesla. Yeah, that word came from Tesla. You know it because he was working with the reverse flyback, the opposite yeah. polarity. Right, exactly. He knew, 
what what man creates when he initiates initiates an energetic wave into a device is forward positive uh, uh, forward polarity and that device once you remove your forward polarity no matter what that device is it's going to create an opposite equal reaction equal keyword exactly. equal yeah. that's right yeah Once so you how are you going to lose yeah. how are you going to lose energy by spinning a wheel yeah. if you can get the equal opposite reaction back into right. your battery or whatever right the so, only way you, you know lose what? energy by spinning the wheel is by slowing down the wheel and allowing your magnet to trigger your switch for the longer duty cycle. Now you're losing right. energy. Yeah. But if you keep the frequency as short bursts in a very fast trigger, yeah. where's the loss? You're getting there's the equal no opposite reaction for every uh, that's reaction. Right. That's the, that's you don't get that. You don't get that mind. equal. If you hold the trigger down longer and release, you're not going to get the same length of holding down on the opposite exactly. direction. You it's have to time it cycle. with the nature the duty provides. cycle. Yeah, it's the duty cycle, right? So, like my on my wheel, uh, you go too long on your duty cycle, and you're messing it up. That's right, and that's why uh, uh, Robert Adams he only had four magnets, so that means there's four pulses per. 360 degrees of revolution. I thought he was pulsing uh, two coils with the forward pulse and feeding the reverse pulse into the other two coils at the same time and pushing four magnets simultaneously like that. No, That's the way no, I understood it. it. it yeah, it, it's confusing, but it's actually a four pulse system per revolution. Simultaneous pulse or? Simultaneous, or? yeah. Yeah. So no, I oh I see what you're getting. Sorry, My you bad. got me. You heard me there. You yeah. got that. Yeah, it's <laughs> all good. All right. All right. So <laughs> yeah, on his system he had two drive coils. Okay. And the so reverse was perfect. feeding the reverse flyback was feeding the other two coils. Right. So the two drive coils on either side they're 90 degree, 180 degrees off. 180 degrees. Right? So for 180 flip. You get a pulse. Another 180, you get a pulse. All right. So you got two pulses per 180. So in order to make a full 360, you're getting four pulses. See where I'm getting at? You got but the they're simultaneous pulse. pulses. Two pulses that, are creating two more, correct. but they're so fast that they're quite frankly right. they're simultaneous. Right. And it, uh, you know they're pulsing in nanoseconds. If you had you know, the time. The the the, the 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 length between the, the forward flyback and the forward flyback and the reverse flyback the 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 right. speed of which they are separated the time of which they are separated right. is so so here's man, another so. way there's another way to look at this as well so for every revolution if there's four pulses that means there's less than twenty percent of the entire three sixty spin has power. All right, so 75% of the 360 degrees that that wheel is going around, the power is not on. It's a free spin. You know, I kind of so, got that, what you just said there. I kind of got that. Yeah. So I'm still duty, thinking, it, processing it though. It's the duty cycle. The longer the duty cycle. What was cycle, the duty cycle? It's, it's basically about 25%. 25%. Um, yeah. So and only 25% of the time that power is on. So that means 75% of that revolution of one spin, the power is off. Only 25% of that 360 degree revolution that the power is actually on. Right. And that other 75% of the time is the flyback. It's, it's charging. charging. It's, it's charging. feeding the other coils. So Right. So you got 75% charging and only 25%. Hmm. Now I'm getting it. Okay. Right? I see so, the code, the COP happening here. Right. So my motor, I got one drive coil. I'm only having my motor pulse. I got six pulses per revolution. So 
In actual fact, mine's actually drawing a little bit more power. The duty cycle's a little bit higher, but you have to put into perspective my wheel's larger. Okay, a larger wheel, so I got more pulses per revolution. So you know, I'm under say 35% of the time that wheel's spinning that the power's actually on. The rest of it is off and generating. So. It all has to do with duty cycle. How long the right. actual power is being put in. So I can I've actually, you know, most of my motors that I do run, like the small one. Um, oh, actually, I've got a wheel here. Actually, this one has only got four magnets. Uh, this one's cut on the water jet, and it's four magnets on. And I also got. Uh, well, this one here has got steel bearing, but usually I have ceramic bearings. So, so I'm not, that. I'm not working on the Adams motor or nothing, but I came up with a Bedini modification here where the one pulse bounces back in, you know, from one battery to <coughs> another battery and back and forth, right? That's an excellent system. It works. Well, let me tell you, uh, let me ask you what, let me show you the video and let me, have you uh, asked me a question or see if you see anything you don't get uh, and let me try to like you know hopefully you you see this and um, you'll be like okay you know because this took me a while to uh, get it out of mm -hmm. my well, just head. to show you I'm oh, sorry just uh, <laughs> I, uh, I bought myself um, a sterling engine Oh, so I yeah, I got one of those too, the, the, the hot and full thing. Yeah, they're amazing. I, uh, I'm actually uh, investigating this. I actually want to build a larger version. That could yeah, a larger a version would definitely give you an over, like a COP that, that's like ridiculous. Okay. That little thing, that little tiny thing is putting out a half a watt. You could put it on a block of ice and it will spin. Oh, it's unbelievable what this thing is. If they actually put it to you this way. In the 70s, NASA was working on them quite extensively. They actually had one running a, uh, a, pick, uh, a Chevy. If everybody knew how to build a Sterling engine, it would be like uh, you know, <laughs> it was just closed. different story. It's ridiculously easy. Right now they're open because these two are closed. So this is thermal physics. So let me go to the main circuit. There it is. Do you see that? That's uh, that's the circuit, right? And um, it's basically the Benini circuit times two. Mm -hmm. And you got your and batteries on the left and right. So there, right. so just kind of clarify uh, to me. So when the when the circuit's being flipped, they're 180 degrees off each other. You got four switches, um, two are okay. on. They're all on at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. And only two slows. Uh, I'm trying to get used to this uh, screen there again. Okay, now you can see it, right? <coughs> so, and when these two open, these two at the top here will close. So what's going on is, um it's like an alternator it's alternator from side to side right can you see my mouse moving uh yeah i got uh, <laughs> oh yeah okay i see it yeah yeah you see the switch up there right and the switch over here yeah these two switches control this inductor okay this is the positive rail to the battery Right. And that's the negative. Got See you. it? Yeah. So there's your, you know, your flyback goes this way out the diode, the high voltage diode to the other battery. Right. And the you're negative here. Track the yeah. The negative of the flyback here goes this way to the other battery. Right. When these two. Yeah, you're just directing, the uh, directing the flow of current right. where it's going. And these, while these are still open. Then these two will close while right. these are still open. And then these two close, right? Charge the other inductor. While these right. two are open, 
these two that are closed will now open. Right. And the flyback will go into this battery. Now, first, first keep in mind though the this 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 coil was charged. Now, how are uh, now how are those um, how are those actually controlled? Are they controlled by a, um, a computer? Or, uh, well, I'm using Adreno because uh, it's easier with the Adreno because with the Adreno I can. So you got four transistors. Two are triggered at the base together, right. and the other two are triggered at the base together, and they're not right. they're they're not closed at the same time. Any, any of yeah, them. I was I was um, toying with the idea of uh, getting myself a Raspberry Pi, and uh, you can buy the relays. Well, I just uh, spent a few hours one day getting the Adreno worked out, and it's not that hard. Um, I can even send you the code to run this when I'm done oh, with yeah, it. Yeah, the code for it. Yeah, I was uh, dabbling with the Arduino. I used to program all the motherboards for 3D printers, so I was setting up all the code. I mean, you don't have to use the Adreno. You can no. You can trigger... That's what I was. Yeah, I was thinking about the Raspberry Pi because then you could uh, get those uh, add-on boards that have the uh, the actual relays on the board, and you. Know, you do but do you see wire. this so far? You you kind of see this? Yeah. Yeah. You see what's going on, right? Yeah, how it's flipping the, the circuit. So it's just basically bouncing back and forth, so you don't have to you don't have to flip your swap your batteries on the uh, anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's exactly <laughs> what you want to do. Yep. I had to add the other two transistors because with only two transistors, it was just two before. I had to add two more yeah. because yeah. when it was just two, two, it didn't work. Yeah. See, what I tried to, uh, like, I've done a lot of podcasting in the last couple of years, and I've always told everybody what I try to do with my system is recycle the power. So you're switching it from battery to battery. While one's running the system, the other one's getting charged. And then when that's full, then you flip the switch and you flip the battery. So you're 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 creating a system that's a recycling system, right? Right. So this that's is this is basically recycling the pulse back and forth. The every pulse is going back and forth. Yeah. Back and forth, back and forth. Yep. Yep. And then uh, that way, as long you, as you, you uh, as long as you switch you switch two transistors together while the other ones are open, and then you open yeah. these, and then you close yeah. these, and you open. And then close, open, and then close, and that's basically switching the positive and the negative using two transistors to switch the positive and the negative side of one inductor. See, uh, the way my system, like uh, my Renegade or the Adams motor type setup, I've got it to the point now where it's running on such little current input that it, I, I run a 50 volt battery bank. I run four 12s. Uh, and you're configured well, it to to feed the flyback to your other two coils, right? Yeah, and you know the flyback is through also that transistor. Through, well, I don't use. I mean, through, through the uh, the uh, the transducer. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So basically, you know, because I have such a little amount of wattage being pulled from the battery, the battery doesn't feel it. That's why my batteries don't die, because. The number that one makes thing sense. that kills, yeah, the number one thing that kills the battery is pulling current off it. Yeah, you, you keep your duty cycle pull. short. You're not going to have that problem. That's right, and you're because of using the lead acid battery. When second you shut the power off, well, guess what happens? The battery regenerates that recovery. It bounces back. Yeah, because it's a chemical. Yeah, that's right. So you got the lead acid composition working for you now if you put some of that back emf spike into it what happens is that chemical composition actually starts to boil when you create that boil scenario in there that's what you want that's, you know, even the beanie talks about the boiling when you get the battery boiling it's like stirring the pot as soon as you shut the power off well guess what all your power comes back it's because that boiling effect well, guess no, what? If you wanted to use this circuit here, Mike, to drive a motor, you could. You just take out yep. two switches, and and the flyback will not go to the batteries; it will go to the opposite coil, back and forth. Yeah. And and that's kind of what the Adams motor was doing. Same yeah. thing. Yeah. Similar. Yep. Yeah. But he was doing it with four inductors. Yeah. I'm doing it with two inductors. Yeah. So 
in my drive coil is just one coil and they got three pickups. And those three pickups drive into a high voltage circuit that I've hooked up to it. So now off my the spin of the wheel is pulsating these giant coils. You have one drive them. coil flying back into three other coils? Yeah, and then I have an extra high voltage circuit which I'm running. And off. you have those I other three coils in series? Uh, they are in series, yes. Not parallel. You could do it too that Not way. Parallel. No, 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 series. I got Why it in series because it's creating current. So I got the high voltage uh, 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 flyback board that's creating high voltage but very little current. So the current is merging with the coil. Uh, the coils is providing that the current that the board doesn't have. They're merging together as one. So now it makes sense to put them in voltage. series because your flyback voltage is really high in voltage. So having your three other right. coils in series right. makes more sense. Right. So if I put say 12 volts into this uh, high voltage uh, board that I have, I get 100 volts DC. AC. Spikes, huh? Right. Uh, no DC. Well, DC. no, it's a DC spike. It's well, the DC spike is spike. an AC signal. It just doesn't. That's right. Here. Right. But yeah, I, you know, common practice, I like to put, always put a bridge rectifier after yeah, that, right. just to make sure it's in proper polarity. And uh -huh. uh, so I got, that's so how I you got the uh, the flyback with just a diode, I guess, right? Yeah, just direct it with the diode. So you know, the wheel spin itself is creating power back into the system. So I can run another motor with that with all that power and the, all the flyback power coming out of that second motor is now recharging that big 50 volt battery bank that I have. So I got a fully looped system now. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You're using the flyback to run a motor that then spins a generator. Yep. And then that generator charges the battery bank. Slick. So I got basically two motors. In no, you, you, you got your head screwed on right here, man. I really do on this. Uh, I've been concept. working on this thing forever. <laughs> you know, I started this whole this whole thing of, uh, I guess, alternative energy uh, back in uh, 2012, but I didn't really catch on to what I was catching mm -hmm. on to <laughs> until yeah. three or four well, years later. Yeah, I started the HHO back in 2004. That was mm. kind of my first dabbling with. Uh, this alternative energy stuff. Yeah, I put one of those hydrogen generators in my car and it increased the fuel economy by about 35 to 40 percent increase. You ever try the Joe sale? Well, it's basically that's what I made. Yeah, it's it's just yeah, right. It's the same thing. Yeah. The electrolyzer. Well, see, back in those days, I didn't realize that. The way I had my design, it was actually created with plasmoids. I thought it was all the hydrogen. It wasn't. There was plasmoids.